Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, nationally renowned comedian, actor, and host, Sean Reap. And now, Rich Redman. rock and rollers yep it's that time another exciting episode hopefully of the rich redman show yeah it's going to be a great show today this is the podcast where we talk all about all things music motivation success we're talking to musicians lots of drummers thought leaders authors comedians jim we're in for a treat today because i was on this gentleman's show four years ago we got we got that's like i don't know 365 times four that's a lot of days we got some things to catch up on he is a national touring comedian he's an actor he's a host he's a podcaster john reap how are you buddy what is up i'm doing great man all things considered how, yeah. how are you brother thanks for having me i'm doing great we're coming from uh Two cities. I'm in uh, off a of Music Row, Music City, USA. Jim's in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and you're in Hickory, Hickory. North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. I like it when other people do it. I've been saying it for so long. My neck is sore, Rich. Because you got to always- use your neck for because some people watch and some people just use their ear holes. So yeah. if they're watching, do the whole the whole treatment there. Okay. So you would ask me where I'm from, and I would say, "Where are you from, man?" <laughs> 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 I'm from Hickory. Uh, see, the thing is, I've noticed this about people who are about uh, who are like proud of where they're from, or, or proud about anything in general. Sure. Their head starts shaking side to side. It's always this way. It's always side to side. Are you serious I, that you've observed that? Like seriously? Oh like yeah, a- yeah. But if you're ashamed of something or where you're from, your head kind of goes up and down, like you're admitting defeat. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm from Spring Hill. So, so yeah, yeah, he's Bruce. Yeah, yeah. So in in Nashville, it would be this. Hickory, it would be this. But maybe it's Bruce. Now, do you have a bobblehead behind you? Oh, actually, I know it looks like a bobblehead, and I should get one because it makes sense for me since I do Hickory and it does like that. This <laughs> is a this is a wee wee doll. Have you ever seen or heard of one Ooh, of these? Dolls? No, I want one though. Oh, they're easily easily attainable. Um. Okay, so we did an episode of, uh, in my podcast, we did this thing called Small Town News. And I think this happened in Tennessee somewhere. Yeah. But apparently there was, a, there was this couple at a hibachi grill somewhere. And the, uh, the chef, who's always entertaining, throwing up food or whatever, he pulls this thing out. And when you pull its pants down, water squirts out. Can you see this? Oh, my God. Oh, that's cool. Oh. <laughs> It's horrible. So apparently, uh, someone pulled this down, and the water got in this lady's eyeball, oh, and no. she sued the oh. hibachi grill. Oh, it's horrible. It, I was, was, it was a crazy story. And then one of our fans heard it and just sent this to me in the mail. I'd like to figure out where you can get those. Maybe because you know what I would do? I'd fill mine with milk. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, give me why a good. Up, sh- because it, I don't you know, understand why would you do that? Yeah, you deserve. Uh, what do you call that? Ba-dum-bum. What is that called? Drum uh, roll? Or- yeah, you, you know two what, of them. when you're listening to satellite radio and it's like, uh, what is it? Um, the comedy channel, Laugh USA. Oh, no. I'll give you that, I'll give you that too. <laughs> So, man, you've been in this racket for a while. I met you in 2016. I was lucky enough to uh, be on your podcast, and we recorded at some gorgeous building over there off of the 405 on the yeah. way to the airport. That's right. Yeah, that was inside of the building where my management is. Yes. Um, uh, 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 um, <laughs> not, not William Morris Endeavor. Levity, thank you. Oh, yeah, Levity. Yeah, so Levity was doing their own podcasting network thing for a minute. Yeah. And then, and then they just realized, no, there's no money here for me. So, <laughs> so they pulled out. And uh, I have started and stopped probably four different podcasts. Well, well, you've got this one country-ish, right? And you, are you yes. still doing the fried one? No, so fried turned into country-ish. Okay, great. Yeah. So you got one less thing to do. It's great. Right, right. Well, it was always either one or the other. I started with fried. So now we're at All Things Comedy, which is a network that does all kinds of podcasts or whatever. Bill Burr, Al Madrigal, Burt Kreischer, all those dudes. Nice. So it's a lot of comedians on one network. Uh, so I went over there with those guys. They liked it called Fried when I was with uh, me and Sarah Tiana had our podcast together called Fried. And then she, she moved, I moved, 
And now I'm back home and I thought like, it's a good time to change the name. And they just partnered with Wondery as well. And so we just changed it to country ish. And Mm -hmm. I thought it fit because I am from Hickory, North Carolina, but I lived and functioned in Los Angeles for about 20 years. Yeah. So I wasn't a hundred percent a country, you know, country dude, but I was by no means Mr. Joe Hollywood either. I was this weird hybrid of both. So you're I a Metro Jethro. Metro Jethro is that's right. That was the special. And then I thought, well, the podcast will be in the same vein. We'll call it country ish. What yeah. uh, what neighborhood did I kind of split my time in from Nashville and West Hollywood? So like, what neighborhood are you in? At, were you in out there? I lived in Studio City for the most. Oh, the part. best! It's the most convenient. Oh God, I loved it. I loved where I lived. I lived in a townhouse right behind CBS Radford. And I tell my comedian friends this all the time. If you ever want to get a sitcom canceled, I was on a sitcom called Rodney for oh, two yeah. seasons. Oh, yeah, great, yeah. With Rodney Carrington. And I tell people, if you want to get a sitcom canceled, all you have to do is buy a townhouse within walking distance, and they will cancel the show for you every time. Oh. So, yeah. But it was uh, – I loved it there. I was walking distance to great restaurants, great sushi places. Um, it was nice. I like – I miss – sushi and i miss a couple of friends and i miss the comedy store other than that i'm very happy to be back in hickory yeah i was gonna i was gonna ask you i mean like you know studio city is like a bougie north hollywood but you've got ventura boulevard which is the restaurant capital street of the world yeah yeah i uh i I could walk to a place called uh, studio cafe which had the most amazing brunches and breakfasts i mean i was you know uh, well, since I, I always, I've always said there's levels of the Metro Jethro, you know, <laughs> like when I was living in Los Angeles, I was probably leaning a little bit more Metro than Jethro. But since I've been back to Hickory, I'm leaning a little bit more Jethro. It's all about your surroundings and your That's environment. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I could go to a nice uh, uh, brunch, a breakfast place, amazing sushi restaurants on Ventura Boulevard and sushi. I mean, in yes. uh, Studio City. They call it the sushi capital of the world, and that includes Japan. Yeah, all you can eat. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, well, apparently, the, uh, on Ventura Boulevard. the tractor supply kind of look is in these days in, in L.A. You know, the, uh, you go shopping a tractor supply, you, you've got a style going. Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, what did we talk about that with? Um, I forget the guess. We're, we're, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Hey, for you, how did this all start? Because your, your parents are like, say, this kid's a mess. Like, like did, when did you know that you wanted to do this? Because uh, certain people have been able to pull back the curtain like Seinfeld and like, hey, this is the life of a touring comedian. It's like sweaty cheese trays and fruit trays backstage and horrible, you know, $40 a night motels. When did that all start for you? <laughs> uh, I started comedy and I uh, quit my job in October of 1998. Um, and then I never looked back. Yeah. I haven't had like you. a real job since then. Um, you know, I, uh, I was a class clown in high school. My dad was the funny one when he was in high school. My brother was after me. Uh, but when you grow up in Hickory, there's no real comedy club to start. Uh, I didn't even know comedy clubs existed outside of LA or New York right? You know, <laughs> back in the day. So I didn't even look at this as an option until I moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. And I went to school at North Carolina State University. Nice. And I was mm-hmm. there for about a, a year or two. And I was actually a theater major. Yeah. And a lot of people were telling me like, you're a funny dude. You should go to the comedy club. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, you didn't know there's a comedy club right next to the campus. And it's happens to be one of the best clubs uh, in the country on the East coast anyway, called Charlie Goodnights. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So I went by myself one day, I just ventured over there because in my brain, I've always had this fantasy of being a comedian. Like I'd go to sleep and fantasize of me on, you know, Johnny Carson and coming out and killing it and him waving me over to the couch and all this stuff. And now there's a comedy club in my town that I'm living and now it's a possibility and that possibility scared the crap out of me because now not only is it attainable, but it is also something that I could screw up, (laughs) (laughs) which is required. Yeah. And now I have a chance to screw up my dream. So did you go do an open mic? I did. I I finally walked over there. I got the courage to walk in one day 
and I just kind of stuck my head in and I saw like this girl on stage and she killed and, and I'm thinking I'm addicted to this. Let me go back to, I did open mics. I started there because everyone thought I was a funny dude and I just did the open mics. I took a class. There was a, um, <laughs> there was one moment that actually sort of catapulted everything. And it's funny. I'm saying the word catapult and there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a panther in this story. Um, so when I was thinking about doing comedy, I was a huge Carolina Panther football fan because we had just got the team. Like yeah. my whole life, I'm like, I wish we had our own team. We finally get a team. I go to a Panther game, and mm -hmm. I ended up getting kicked out uh, because the mascot, Sir Purr, waved me out onto the field to dance with him. But the cops didn't see the invitation. They just thought I was some drunk idiot. Which oh, I was. no. But, but I was invited. This is a classic story that is part of your Wikipedia forever. Yes, it is. It's one of the things. It's, I, I made it, uh, it's at the end of one of my specials, which is out right now, The Ginger Beard Man. That's I on Amazon about, Prime, is that right? It's on Amazon Prime. Nice. I talk about this towards the end. I go, this is what sort of started my career. Um, Anyway, if you ever watch this video, you'll see, like, I'm, I'm, I'm in, like, the six or seven yard line. I'm doing, I'm breakdancing. I'm doing the worm. The whole crowd's going, ah, they're loving it. And, and the cops come out of nowhere. I didn't see them. They come up behind me. And they waited for my butt to get to the peak of the worm. And they just came up, and it was a full-on wedgie. And I was up on my tippy toes going, what the, hey, Sir Purr said it was cool. And, uh. <laughs> And we all, find, we all found out together in that moment that Sir Purr, the uh, Carolina Panthers mascot, does not have the authority to invite people onto the field. And Did you so, know the guy? Uh, was the guy in, in the suit? Did you know the guy? I ne no, I didn't know him. He just saw this drunk kid dancing in the stands, having a fun time, and everyone yeah. was looking at me. And I happened to be standing kind of close to the fence, uh, where he was doing his own thing. And so he just walked over and, and waved me out. Like he invited me out there. And, but the cops, they're not looking at the field for the most part. They're looking up at the stands to see what the, what the troublemakers are. So they didn't see this Panther invite me out there. All they hear is the crowd going crazy and they're turning around and I'm doing the worm. They go, well, he's got to go. Um, but the Panther did try to, uh, <laughs> he did try to defend me. Like, he did come over to my defense and go, wait a second, hang on, leave him alone. We told him to come out here, and then that's when we realized. They said, you, don't, you do not have the authority to invite people onto this field. Oh. And so the Panther was like, whoopsies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I get kicked out. Hey, maybe you can do that at a Hickory Crawdads game. Oh, oh. You, you know, one of these days. I've actually been to one. When people really, Jim? go back to big stadiums and arenas, I would love to do that again. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I looked at some of your tour dates, and it looks like you potentially are doing Ram's Head. Are you coming to Zany's in our backyard here in December? Yeah. Yes. And, unless so, something changes. I mean, those gigs are the ones that haven't been canceled yet. So Zany's is reopened. I don't know if they're like, I've been there a million times, yeah. um, but it's like tight quarters. I don't know if they're going to like limit the number of bodies in there, how it works. I don't know. I've had to, I've had to postpone and reschedule many gigs. The one that you look, you just mentioned Ram's head. That's the, <clears throat> this will be the fourth or third attempt of uh, this year of trying to make this gig happen. Um, you know, they've had to cancel. I've had to cancel. It's, it's all about uh, butts and seats. And if you can't do it, yeah. No one's going to make money and I can't, you know, I can't afford to fly all the way somewhere and for five people. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember that place. We, uh, yeah. we, we played that joint many times coming up with the early Aldine days, like oh, yeah. 2005, six, seven, those days. No, the Zanies, uh, I'm, as far as I know, I'm still doing new year's Eve. That's one of the best clubs in the country. Um, and I think they, they are doing shows, but I don't know if they're at a hundred percent capacity. They're probably at like 30%. Or yeah. Something. It has a, had to have hit, affect you guys in a big way as well. 
massive. We, I got the news in March on March 12th and we canceled our last two shows. And first thing I did on March 12th was, you know, first fly it out on the 13th to Los Angeles to quarantine for six months with my girlfriend. I was like, if I'm going to go through quarantine, I'm going to go with like a beautiful girl that I've got a relationship with instead of being, yeah. you know, so uh, I've been out there. And then I came back to um, Nashville for uh, some cataract surgery. Now my parents are 25 years older than me and we all had the same surgery. And I'm like, why do I'm like, I just had my 50th birthday. I went out to Joshua Tree and played drums naked and looked at the stars and had some hung out with my with my gal. It was really fun, you know. But I was like, man, I. But now I have bionic eyes. I can see you perfectly, John. My mother just had a cataract and glaucoma surgery. Yeah, but you know, it's good for glaucoma. I sure do. Yeah. <laughs> I drive. I try to talk her into some edibles, but yeah. uh, you know, it's hard to get here in Hickory. CBD eye drops. <laughs> right? those, can, those might work. Yeah. So she's been taking eye drops for the last 15, 20, 30 years or something like that. Her whole life is scheduled around when it's time to put the eye drops in. Oh, my God. Yeah. I have to do like 12 a day for like a month. I mean, you have to do – that's right. So you got to do three in the morning, three in the afternoon, and three at night, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that is that for both eyes or just one? For both eyes. So I had the first eye done with a two-week padding, and then in case it goes wrong and you lose your sight, and then you go in – then I went in on last Wednesday and had the other eye done, and then by the end of the month, I should be golden. Yeah. Um, that's, that's tough, right? They, yeah. They, uh, but it's all one day you're in and out. Is your, your vision's good though now, right? Yeah, you know what I got is like, I need some non-reflective readers, but now I've got these bionic eyes where they put this lens in your eye and it's there until you hit the dirt. Like it'll be here for the next 30 years if I get 30 years out of this. And um, uh, so now I can see perfectly far away, but then to read music or read this, I got to have readers. <laughs> Damn. You're like, and I paid 10 grand for this. <laughs> right damn yeah, hopefully uh it'll work out but yeah um i know what you're going through yeah uh, because i during quarantine I, I unfortunately was not able to stay with a beautiful girl like you <laughs> but i'm not saying my mother is a beautiful girl sure but you know she's 72 and she's my mother yes uh, so <laughs> that's my roommate these days i went from living in los angeles in a studio apartment by myself to now living back in the, the same house I grew up in, uh, in my same room where there's posters and pictures of me as a kid and through high school and stuff. Trophies. Living with my mother. So it's full circle. Yeah, it's the, it's the cycle of life. So you get <laughs> bit by the comedy bug. You get the gumption. You, get the, you go and you do your open mic. You yes. get like, and then does that turn into... Do you get representation? Are you opening for people? Right. Where does that fit into season five winning NBC's last comic yeah. standing? So it starts off doing open mics at good nights. I started getting really good there. You know, like the small fish in a, a big fish in a small pond scenario. I started going outside the club doing gigs here and there, different places. I meet some other people. I win contests, little, little small contests along the way. There starts to be a little bit of a buzz about me or whatever. Um, and then I got, uh, I started doing feature work. I just was like, you know what? I'm going to hit the road. Back in the day, you could actually make a living, not really make a living, but you could survive uh, as a feature act and not have to know the headliner. Today, it's different for comedians. I don't know how they do it today. But I was lucky <laughs> when I started that I could actually uh, go to comedy clubs all over the country and get paid and not have to know the headliner and do this all over the place. And so doing that, different club owners would hear you, would see you. They'd be like, oh, they heard this kid about this kid, this kid from Hickory. It's pretty funny. This kid from Hickory, whatever. And then um, I got invited in the, uh, the year 2000. So I quit my job in 98. I hit the road full time, making no money really. I'm living off my credit card, just the bare minimum. But as young and stupid, I didn't care. Um, I went into debt, and uh, luckily things worked out. But I, yeah. I was invited to uh, the Montreal Just for Laughs uh, festival. That's a big one. It is for comedians. That's you know, like the out. that's like the Newport Jazz Festival, or you know, playing Madison Square Garden. Right. That's the Super Bowl of comedy festivals. Yeah. If, you, if you do well there, um, you're going to end up with representation or an agent or maybe a deal. Um, there's, there's been talks of guys 
going there without any representation and walking out. The year before me, a guy got like a half a million dollar development deal. Ah. So everyone thought like, well, that's going to be me. Um, but I did well there and uh, well enough to get meetings with different agents and managers. And uh, I, I, moved, I went to LA and took all these meetings and they all said the same thing. They all said, you're a funny dude. You're very physical. Perhaps you should move to Los Angeles and audition for things. Um, and I was like, well, I am a theater major. And they go, okay, well, that works out. No one was giving me money. They were just saying, come to L.A., you'll probably do fine. And then I moved to L.A. in 2000. And the, the next thing I got was a commercial agent. And the first big thing I did uh, that was on television was... Drum roll. Was... Do you have it? You got a Hemi in that thing? Is that thing got a Hemi? I heard drum roll. I'm waiting to see if I hear a drum roll. Oh, we don't. I don't think we have a sample we have of that. Two drummers on this show. We can't get a damn drum roll. Oh, hold my, on. We hold really on, need on, that, on, Jim. <laughs> Here. Here we go. I know. I really spoiled. I really spoiled the Hemi joke, but you're going to plant it. Now, you did six spots on the Hemi. Yes. For Dodge, right? I Dodge Ram. doing six national Dodge truck commercials. And you, you have a montage. I, I'll, yes, I will give you the montage. Yes. This is all six of them real fast, back to back. I love right. it. I'm in a beat up duster. You guys are a Dodge Ram 1500 uh, with a Hemi engine in it. Here we go. I pull up and I go, hey, that thing got a Hemi. You about to find <laughs> out. Come on, man, floor it. Give me closer. I smell a Hemi. That can't be good. Sweet. That's all six of them. I love sweet. <laughs> sweet. Yeah, that was not even me. That was the other guy. That was the only line he ever said was the guy in the car with me. All he ever said was sweet. But now as an actor, potentially, he, he had less lines than you, but potentially, depending on his agent, he could have made the same money in residuals. Well, I will tell you, uh, he did the very first commercial. Ah. And then the second commercial, I had a pretty good agent. And, you know, it was, you know what favored nations is, right? Sure. So it was favored nations at first. And then the second commercial comes around and my agent's like, well, you're the funny one in this. So maybe we could ask for more money. I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. You know, I've never even had an agent before. And so he, each commercial, now if Dodge was smart, they would have locked me down to a contract and it would have lasted that long, but they didn't know that this commercial would turn into what it turned into. It was kind of viral. Yeah, it was. Well, it's one as before you could fast forward through commercials too. Yeah. I mean, and people so, stopping you in grocery stores and giving you preferential treatment in restaurants and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was insane. I mean, uh, it was one of those things you could not avoid, especially if you're a dude and you watch sports. It yeah. was on like every commercial break. You'd hear, I thank God to hear me. You know, <laughs> I actually remember where I was the first time I saw it on TV. I was sitting at a uh, sports bar. It was the first year I played fantasy football with my buddies. And I happened Ever? to be in yeah. Really? Yeah. You've this never played like, fantasy football before? Jim, I've never played it. <laughs> I have. From Connecticut. Yeah. Well, not, <laughs> wow. no, this is 2002. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 18 years sense. ago, I'm talking. Yeah. So that's hey, when are the you, very Are you doing it now? No, I just play pick them now. We, oh, we, we took a year off because we didn't know. Uh, are they going to play? Is someone going to not play? Is someone going to get COVID? We don't know what the deal is. So we took a year off and now we just do a pick them thing. Gotcha. But, um, but I remember where I was in 2002 when the first commercial aired, I was at a bar in St. Louis somewhere by myself right next to the hotel. I had a day off in between gigs and I just wandered over and I had, this was before, you know, smartphones were as good as they are. So I didn't yeah. have, I had paper. And I came in with, these pa with this paper. I'm looking at all the TVs, writing down. Like, you know, I was really into it when I first started it. And, uh, all, and it, wasn't, it was barely crowded in there. There was maybe like 20 people in the place. And I just heard, I think I got a Hemi. I think I, I, think I got a Hemi. And it was like, it popped up on different t televisions because there were different games on. I was like, oh, yeah. Who's me? That's me. And I got all excited. But, yeah, it, it turned into it a crazy, crazy campaign. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's kind of like a launching pad for you. So was that pre last comic standing? Yes. Okay. That was before. Now, mind you, I had been doing stand up for four years at this point. 
Um, but no one talks about that. They just remember the commercial. But that commercial got me better management, better agents, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, I went on to do like six of those commercials. And then I was on, um, I did some Comedy Central shows like Premium Blend. Yeah. Um, I had my own half hour special called, they, they called it Comedy Central Presents. Um, and then I was on a sitcom with Rodney Carrington. That had to be fun. Now, now, now I, I, got, I hate to interrupt, but I got to ask. Tell us some sitcom stories because every, Jim knows and all the listeners know that if I wasn't playing drums for the last 44 years, my secret career fantasy, and I'm kind of working towards it, splitting my time in Los Angeles, studying acting, studying hosting, studying voiceover is, I, would, I don't even care where I I could be the last guy on the call sheet. I just want to experience the euphoria that comes from the taping of a live 22-minute yeah. format sitcom multicam. Wow. It is addictive and it's, I have been chasing that carrot since the sitcom I was on. And so it was I, euphoric. It was, it was, they were laughing and they were laughing. I mean, I watched the, the footage. You're playing a cop. You yeah. had like short hair. Yeah. 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 It's the best job that I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Because I was not the main character. I was just a guy that would show up, say a couple of funny lines and get out of there. But, the, but, but look, at that time, that money, it's primetime network money. Yes. And it was great. And I could walk there and walk back. And I have been chasing that ever since. But you're right. The, the writers, well, the, the audience wants to, they're, they're having a good time anyway. They're on your side. They're on your side. They're, 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 they got a warm-up guy in the crowd, and, and they're doing jokes in between takes. And, and you could do, you know, do a lot of takes, but but you are in a hurry when there's a crowd there and the clock is ticking because there's there's a lot of people on the payroll and everyone's got to we got to wrap this up so you can't mess up too many times yeah. but but you are comfortable it's not like a live performance where it's right here in the moment it's like all right cut let's do it again and sometimes <laughs> it gets funnier as you go me and Rodney were always trying to make the other guy laugh and um, I was very very fortunate that Rodney liked me because. It, it, it made me feel comfortable enough to to take chances and to improv and to, and just to wing it sometimes. And um, I mean, there's there's one episode where he could not keep a straight face, and I wasn't even being to me that funny. I was like walking up to his car, and I pulled him over for speeding or something, and um, and he's like apologizing for speeding. He's in a hurry. Something about his kid. And then I start bawling because I love the father son dynamic or something like that. But it's the pre it's the prelude to the crying that made him laugh. Cause I would sit there and be like, I'd be like, I'd, I'd, I would be like, I'd, I'd take it in, you know, I'd be like, oh, damn it, Rodney. Like I started like getting into it. And, th and that's what made him laugh because me trying because to be he had serious. The giggles. He had the giggles. Me trying right? to be serious would bust him up every time. So, yeah. But you're right, man. There's nothing like a, a prime a 22 minute prime times. That's the best. Well, I mean, there's like 500 between all the platforms, your Hulu's and your Amazon Prime's and your Netflix. It seems like the way to do things now is not wait for the suits. And it's like literally create your own show and pitch it and try to hope. I mean, there's so many more options now for, for yeah. platforms. That's true. Uh, that's what I've, that's part of the, why this podcast is what it is. And uh, yeah. actually when I moved back home, uh, about, uh, what was it? Two years ago now, two and a half years ago, I moved back about two years. Yeah. I moved back home cause my dad had a stroke and I wanted to be around my family more and the sure. industry's changed. And I was like, well, if I'm going to be here, I want to start something here. And the guys at all things comedy said, why don't you, uh, do your own uh, pilot, call it, uh, you know, um, Hickory live. And so yeah. we shot our own TV show and, uh, <laughs> in March, I had meetings set up all over Los Angeles to go pitch it. And my manager goes, yeah, so there's this thing called Corona. And so they're going to reschedule all these meetings until that passes. That was in March. Well, how many episodes did you have in the can or was it just a sizzle? We just did the one pilot, but gotcha. we have a lot of footage. We, we filmed a lot of different things. We have different sketches. We have different guests. We had Brad Paisley on. We had John Rich. We had Michael Waltrip. Um, some guys from the sitcom Rodney, um, but but you know we're kind of sitting on it because we're still like in limbo. Yeah. But I'm hoping 
that these meetings can get rescheduled. If not, I still feel like we're going to do our own thing. We're going to grow our own YouTube channel. We're going to keep doing this podcast because you're right. That is the way of the future is like, just do your own thing. And if it's good enough, people will find it. it you know what it is? It's persistent. It's like, sure. don't, yeah. stop. don't go. Away. I mean, look at the, I just, I just fell in love with that show. Shit's Creek. I'm sure you've seen oh. it. It's like an all Canadian <laughs> cast. Right. Yeah. And it's like multi-generational cast that, you know, like comedy royalty. They were at it for six years, winning no awards. And then all of a sudden they won all the awards, which has never happened in the 70 year history of the Emmys. I and, know. And they just found their audience. And then look at Insecure. You know, it's like um, the creator of that show, she just did a web series and they shot all guerrilla style on a budget, got some attention, got to the suits at HBO. And then you had the marketing power of HBO. And it's a brilliant show. Brilliant. Yeah. You're right, man. It's it's so different now. I'm happy for Shit's Creek too because yeah. I also came to that party late. I, I started watching it maybe like, uh, six months ago, my girlfriend turned me on to it. She goes, yeah. you got to watch this. And the son is the funniest thing ever. Like, He's incredible. <laughs> it's so funny. Daniel That's Levy, yeah. So quick, so yeah. quick. And um, so, yeah, I'm the same way. Uh, I, I love, uh, I'm just going to keep doing this and keep plugging along. And hopefully, see, back in the day, it was like, you know, after doing uh, uh, um, the Montreal Just for Laughs Festival, like I said, yeah. the guy before me, he got a half a million dev dollar de development deal and he hadn't done anything yet. That will never happen again. Yeah. Now when you take these meetings, they're going to go, well, what are you doing? What, let me see it. What's your YouTube channel? What are you doing? What are you doing right now? I'm like, uh, nothing. Why don't you just give me the money? First? <laughs> Content is king, man. <laughs> so you got to go do a bunch of crap. And well, they, 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 they want to see what kind of leverage you have you bring to the table. Yeah. Socials. Yeah. They want to know your so social numbers. Of, so hopefully you're not, you don't know, you're not business savvy enough and we can take advantage of the leverage you've <laughs> built and monetize it. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds that ain't right. happening with John though. Not, John, let me ask you this. Are you I mean, no, with a, anybody in general? Yeah. You're a music fan, right? A lot of, of your guests are musicians and do you play, do you play an instrument? No, for a minute I, I did uh, take guitar lessons for a second and I don't know how you guys do it. It's a lot of devotion to, to something that you got to spend all day, all night. You got, it's a lot of practice. My instrument was me just going up and trying jokes out, but yeah. I never really, the guitar thing was catching on for a minute. And then I went on the road for two weeks and I came back and all the calluses I had worked up had went away. Yeah. And I picked it up again and went, ow! Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's a commitment to calluses is what it is, you know? A commitment to calluses. It's That's a, a commitment to calluses. <laughs> well, the only reason I bring this up is, 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 John, the sponsor of our show is the School of Rock. I'm sure you're familiar with these guys. Jack oh, yeah. Black, you know, brought, the, brought that, you know, franchise to life with this beautiful movie. But there's 250 locations. It's a global phenomenon right here in Nashville. Of course, you know, it's the songwriting capital of the world we got three locations um one being built in mount juliet right jim and we got one in franklin one in nashville the people that run it they've been at it for a decade angie and kelly mccray they really care about their students they're cranking out amazing musicians kids that play drums guitar they slap at the bass they play keyboards people learn how to front a band so parents if they want to get their kids involved you know the kids are out they're doing ballet they're taking piano lessons they're dropping them off to soccer practice but you want to get them involved with music jim how do we make this happen you got to go to their email rich the what emails is that? are as follow there's franklin at schoolofrock.com rich and uh nashville at schoolofrock.com rich and John. thanks jim i'm actually using the garth brooks um method for remembering people's names you have to say someone's name 21 times so it it's so it, it, it ingrains in your synapses yeah well, you just make a copy of their driver's license and stick it in your pocket so you can look at it yeah jim used to have to do. good job jim yeah. So, John, I'm so, I'm so, <laughs> Rich. I'm, thank you. Thank you, first of all. Yes, it is John, <laughs> Rich, and Jim. I appreciate it. I, I, you know, I've, I have been uh, guilty of forgetting people's names many, many times, and I hate it. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Um, actually, one story. time at the comedy store, a guy that I know, I'm not going to mention his name because it's embarrassing for me and him, <laughs> mostly me. But I was, sitting here, I was sitting here talking to another comedian, and this comedian walks up. 
I was like, oh, hey, dude, I talking about you. And I called, guy? Him wrong, I called him the wrong name. I didn't even call him big guy. That would have been a smart move to oh. say buddy, big guy, brother, chief, yeah. anything but what I said. A total of another human's name. And he looked at me right in the eyes. He goes, that's not my name, dude. Like, what? <laughs> he called you. Oh. Another comedian's like, in front of the other person? Yes. Like, and like <laughs> it was it was awkward and sad and weird and i was just like i'm sorry man i've been drinking all night but it's i was talking about another guy i, I just had to like tiptoe out of the room they were just like oh I, I did he ever that. tell you your, his real name to get no to i know who he is uh, i don't know why just I said spaced uh, i just spaced yeah. it was actually talking about a different comedian that was on the same show as him so it was that but i never got a chance to explain myself because other comedians heard me say this guy's name wrong, and then they started giving me shit. Wow. <laughs> I, uh, I did that once in front of 5,000 people. I forgot the uh, name of a band I was introducing. Yeah, Jim was hosting an event and forgot yeah. the band's name. Isn't that yeah. great? And their name what? was the freaking Martins of all freaking names. And, I, you know, I literally, I'm like, hey, you guys, we're ready for the show to go on. Everyone's cheering, and the band's behind me. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, I forgot their freaking name. That's the worst. Whole, and I literally, I was like, should I lean back and ask the guys? Uh, yeah. And they're on, they're on side stage watching yes. me. Oh, no. You oh. should have said, Jim, you could have been like, so sorry, be right back. And then you ask the drummer, what's the name of the band? I didn't do that. It would be too obvious. I basically, I did the whole thing of like, Hey guy, you know, I did come on out guys. And I, it's the I boys in the band. Off. Yeah. <laughs> you know who they are. They need, know who they you are. know them. You know love them. I don't know. I forgot their friggin' name. So, <laughs> oh, John, did you ever see um, Jim Carrey produced Showtime show? I'm dying up here about yes. the, so did, when did Mitzi pass? Did you ever meet her? Yeah. She, she actually, um, is the one who made me a regular at the comedy store. You have to get her kiss of approval. Yes, it's dumb, but you did. Um, I remember, uh, also I remember you had to have someone run a diversion so that she would pay attention to you because she was so kind of, uh, when she did show up at the comedy store in like 19, uh, no, this would have been uh, 2000, 2001 or whatever. Mm -hmm. She was a little older even then. And when she, so she wasn't coming as often, which means other comedians would bombard her for attention, like always coming up to her, always coming up to her. So when it was your turn to showcase for Mitzi so that you could get in, you had to make sure that she was watching you oh. because if someone came over and talked to her while you were on stage and she didn't see it, you wasn't going to get past and you didn't know when she was coming back. And so I, I luckily I had a friend named Jeff Richards who goes, all right, you're going to showcase this day. I'll, I'll be there. I'm going to stand right next to her and I will make sure no one talks to Mitzi when you're on stage. And so I went on stage, I did my set and Jeff was like going like, like Mitzi, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. You know, she was like, he had to run interference for me so that I could get uh, to become a paid regular. But yes, she, um, she did have to give you the, uh, the kiss of approval. Yeah, to kiss the ring. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He had to kiss the ring, but that happened for me in like 2001 or something like that. 2002. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's really one of the best places for comedians. It's like a frat house. Yeah. You got three different rooms going off at all times. You got a main room, the original room and the belly room. Yeah. And there's comedians just going air, running back and forth between each one. There's green rooms. Who knows what's happening in this green room? What's going on over here? Um, it's, it's a great for comedy, but you know, I think, I don't even know if they're going to stay open right now. I don't know. What's oh happening. no, that you know, would be I, so bad. There's already like a lot of comedy clubs that are shutting their doors and uh, who knows if they're going to recover because yeah, uh, it's tough. There was one in Austin, Texas that just shut down and it's one of the best clubs ever for comedians called Cap City and we don't know if they're coming back. Man, it's so crazy. Everything I do as a touring drummer, as a recording drummer, as a motivational speaker, as a teacher, everything I do involves being around people. So this has been in such an interesting six months, you know? Yes, um, wow. I went, I did, I've done one gig where I went to, um, this was, uh, so since March, Everything's been sort of like haywire, right? Right. I had one gig in June or July, and it was in Tampa, Florida. So I flew to Tampa because Florida's like, we're not changing, you know. <laughs> right. Okay. And my parents are there, which is awesome. <laughs> Jeez. 
<laughs> Florida's like, we don't get, we don't get sick. We're fine. Um, they just ignore, they don't listen to rules. So I'm like, well, I go to Florida. I got this offer. And it was funny because other gigs were canceling before I went there. You know, they were like, well, COVID can't do it. Let's reschedule. Let's reschedule. Except for this one gig. And it was Tampa. It was like a game of chicken. Like who's going to cancel first me or the club. And so finally they didn't cancel. I'm like, well, crap, I guess I got to go. And so I fly to Florida, I do the gig. And uh, I was convinced I was going to come out of there with COVID um, <laughs> because I didn't change either. I was like, once I got there, and I noticed no one was caring about it. I was like, well, uh, I, I think I saw two or three masks the whole time. Yeah. I, I did the meet and greet. I shook hands. I took pictures. I did all of it. And I'm like, I know I've got it. And I didn't get it. But I do have a product that I sell now. And I want you to see this. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. And Jim and I want one so bad. This, this I saw Ginger beard man. The, the ginger beard mask. Now, my nose is probably about eight sizes too big. And my mouth is not this big. This looks I don't more know. Like an orang- uh, more like an orangutan. <laughs> or like a Muppet. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's, are, know, those fly, are those flying off the shelves? They were when I was doing comedy, but now they're just on a shelf. <laughs> and right out, uh, my production, my uh, merchandise company is in White House, Tennessee, right next to Nashville. Oh, who is it? Who is Missing it? Ink. I, I used to sell no. my shirts with missing ink. Yeah, yeah. Dave Snyder, Pam yeah. Snyder. What a small world. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. That's funny. So I'll get you one of these. I still That's have incredible. Them. I'll call Dave up. Like, hey, man. <laughs> Give us some beard masks. Get yeah, on your YouTube channel. It's, yeah, dude, get it's hilarious that. when people see these because yeah. sometimes I'll forget that I'm wearing it and I'll just have it on. And I'll be going to a store and people just bust out <laughs> laughing. I'm like, what? Oh, right, right. Oh, yeah. It looks really comfortable. It is. The, the weirdest time this happened for me, it's going to sound weird but or crazy or morbid, but it's trust me, it turns out fine. I go to visit my dad. Uh, my dad's at a skilled nursing facility, right? Mm. And we can't even get in the building. We have to go to a window and look at him through a window. So me and my mom to go to visit my dad. Ah. And it's a somber moment. It's kind of like, you know, let's go visit dad and check in and all this stuff. And I forget, I put this thing on, you know, I forget what, I forget that this is on here. And I'm walking up to the window and there are other people at other windows looking at their loved ones. And I walk up and there's this couple next to me. And this lady just started looking at me like, like she was (laughs) disgusted. (laughs) And she was staring at me. And I, again, I forgot I had it on. I was like, and I was like staring at me. I was like, hey, how you doing? She just kept looking at me. And she goes, what is on your face? I was like, oh, yeah, sorry. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my mask. I, I made some of my face. She goes, and she goes it's horrible. <laughs> I said, well, it, it's my face. <laughs> and she didn't say, ouch. Oh, I'm sorry. She goes, what? Basically, she called my face horrible, and I and I don't disagree with her. No, <laughs> no. Okay. Well, you, you, Jim. So you're looking at the YouTube channel. What are you seeing? I'm there? looking at the YouTube channel, and when I, I was looking at, is that a Hemi? Two videos. Oh, yeah. Of course, the videos themselves really made me uh, take notice. But <clears throat> you had you were on the King of All Podcasters, Joe Rogan show. How was that, man? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. I've known him, you know, because of the Comedy Store. Yeah, the know, Comedy, yeah, comedy connection. Store guy. So we all bump into each other. You see everybody there. And um, he's always been super cool, super nice to me. And when I moved back home, I, I, you know, I had a new album out called uh, Ginger Beard Man. Mm-hmm. I was like, dude, I'm doing as many podcasts as I can. And I, I caught him at the, at the improv one night, and I told him that I was moving out of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. He got very excited. He, goes, well, he moved to Texas, didn't he? he? This was before he moved to Texas. Gotcha. Though which yeah. is why he got excited because he couldn't wait to get out. So when I told him I was leaving Los Angeles, he was like, Ooh, tell me all about it. What are you doing? I was like, Oh, I think mm. I'm going to get a nice big lake house on Lake Hickory. He goes, Ooh, I want to do that so bad. I said, he goes, send me pictures when you get there. I'm like, okay, what's your number? So I got his phone number. Um, and then I come home and I had a new album out or special. So I just text him. And by the way, I have a publicist and the <laughs> publicist goes, yeah, don't even worry about trying to get on Joe Rogan. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he's so busy. He, you know, he doesn't talk to publicists and I don't think I could get you on there. Yeah, but you went through the front door. I said, let me try. 
<laughs> and then you could tell your publicist, I'm paying you less from now on. Oh, believe me, I wanted to so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I did kind of rub it in her face in a nice, polite, passive-aggressive Southern way. I said, um, so I just text him. I go, hey, Joe, it's John. Uh, I'd love to be on the podcast sometime. And then like 30 minutes, he goes, of course. Nice. <laughs> I love that. So I sent, her always- a screensh- I sent her a screenshot of our conversation. And then, of course, you know, she got You'll it. You never know until you ask. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, well, he doesn't talk to pub. See, he does. He hates the showbiz part of it. Yeah. So he won't talk to publicists because he doesn't That's have good to. to know. He doesn't have to. Like he's Joe yeah. Rogan. People will come. Yeah, but him. I mean, you know, it's amazing. I always talk about his show when he started it in what? Oh seven, oh eight. Yeah. That podcast. That sounds about right. Yeah, and he really hockey stick in the last uh, four years or so, and it was just a grind up until then. You know? Yeah. One yeah. of the biggest podcasts on the planet. He's, the other video that stuck out to me was uh, one of the Hemi commercials. Is that Jim Norton? Uh, Jim Norton was on the podcast. What is it? Was he in the Hemi commercials too? Must, no, you're you're looking at Todd Gibbenheim. That's a guy who looks like Jim Norton. He's right? the guy who just said sweet. <laughs> Good for him. Hey, yeah. now recently you were going to give away one of your residual checks as part of a giveaway. Yeah. Did it's you ever of, tell anybody what the amount was or no? Yeah. So it's a game that we play on the podcast called How Much Is That Screen Actors Guild Residual Check? It's the <laughs> longest title of any game on any podcast. You've been to residuals in Studio City, right? The, 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 oh, the I bar? definitely okay. have. Yeah. yeah okay. So the fun, so it's a game that I play with my buddies, right? Uh, I'll pull out a residual check and it won't be opened. I'll say, Mm -hmm. hey guys, amongst us, if you can guess the amount, I'll give you the check. Now, whoever gets the closest wins the game, but if you get it exactly right, I will give you the check. Now, of course, no one will ever get it exactly right because it's, it's checks like, you know, $5.37. Five dollars and thirty-seven cents. Yeah, or, or it's like three thousand dollars and one hundred. You know, it's like a weird number. Or twenty-three cents. Right. So residuals. What you're talking about is a bar in Studio City that is based on how ridiculously low some of these checks can be. They're less expensive than the stamp and the envelope that it's mailed in half the time. So bad. So I thought I'd make a game out of it, and that's a game that we play on the podcast. And I've got four new ones that we're going to play uh, on the next podcast. <laughs> that's so. incredible. Yeah. you get resi- you got to get residual checks. Well, you know what? I, I uh, John, since we talked four years ago, I, I made some changes in my life, and I decided that I want to like, explore some things that I've always wanted to explore. So I started taking acting classes i was in a horror film on netflix and right. then i and then i got to play a cop you've played many cops i got to play a cop on a show called happy on the sci-fi channel with christopher maloney and i got to beat the hell out of christopher maloney and i got my sag card man welcome to the screen actors boop, boop. and yeah. sag slash after now yeah but i mean i can't get i can't get the insurance i'm not there yet but hey it's a cool fraternity to be in yeah dude well i'll tell you um it's not that big of a deal once you start getting these tiny little 23 cent checks come yeah. rolling in. Well, but I use it. Luckily, thank God. I, you know, I didn't, when I first joined, I was Taft Hartley. Do you know what that is? Oh, Taft sure. Hartley. Where they go like, well, you're non-union, but we love you. And so we're going to have to get you in. Yeah. They will pay the, like the production company or the, uh, uh, the product, you know, for, for me, it was Dodge. Yeah. I had to end up paying extra to use me because I was not already part of the Screen Actors Guild. So then you're forced in, uh, which was fine. At the time, I was like, well, I don't want to be a part of your stupid union. But but I'm happy that I am now because I've got insurance. (laughs) Sure, the insurance is great. And Well, you know what makes – you know, when I'm talking to you, like – I, when somebody is a great conversationalist, is a naturally approachable, likable person, the time just flies. I'm sure you've had all sorts of guests where like some are, some are like pulling teeth, but yeah. you just have the gift of gab and you did a lot of hosting. You had this uh, Bandits versus Smokies on CMT. You hosted mm-hmm. the American Country Awards. You did uh, hosted the Southern Sports Award show. Yeah. It's something that comes very naturally to you. Uh, are you still pursuing that as well? Yeah. I mean, I'm... Um I'm also doing voiceovers. I just did a voiceover for American Dad. So when That's you're stuck at awesome. home, see, the, the, everything's changed now. So, I, and I'm definitely trying to 
uh, the, the sitcom, not the sitcom, the show that I was pitching, I was going to pitch called Hickory Live. I was basically the host of, I was, it was my own sort of tonight show based yeah. in Hickory. So definitely I'm open to anything and all things, but there's not a lot going on, but you can do voiceovers from your house. There's Jim's world right there. Right. So that is something that I'm excited about. I was, um, actually I got hired and fired from a show on TBS. That was the first for me. I actually booked the gig as a, as a voiceover talent. Right. And then we recorded some tracks, recorded some lines, dialogue. And then they said, we've moved on. <laughs> Oh. So it was the first, I, it's street cred for me. I've never been hired and fired on uh, any show in my life. I've been not hired many times. Yes. But to, but to finally say I got fired was Well, great. you know, they say the best advice you can have in this crazy business is to not take it personally because, you know, when you're a musician, you, you got to have a pretty good look. You got to be um, approachable, be able to take direction, be friendly, and be great on your instrument. When you're doing the Hollywood thing, there's a million things working against you. The color of your hair, the color of your yeah. skin, your height, your weight. Like they, the producers have something very, there's a million things working against you. It doesn't mean that you can't go in the room and do a great job, but you just have to go in there, right. do a great job and forget yeah, about it. You because gotta have, you're right. It. You got to have thick skin and you can't take it personal. And I didn't, I just always thought it was a funny, a funny thing to say that I finally got fired from something. Yeah. But, uh, but then I, but then again, I went on to do the, the voiceover for uh, American dad, which is also on TBS. So, it possibly led to something else you know lovely yeah of course jim give us an example of some of the voiceover work you do now jim does some excite, exciting voiceover work and he produces 15 podcasts but sometimes he does steak work and sometimes he does hamburger work yeah yeah and uh okay. here's some of the hamburger work this is uh, you guys ready yeah, okay this drum roll. Is, this is this is a uh, tune out time for the listeners so Thanks for calling Virginia Arms Company. As a full-line brick-and-mortar firearms retail store, we've got everything you need to load up with gear that's proven on any range and in the field. As for our service, there's no BS, no hype, no pushy sales tactics, just industry-leading selection and support you can count on. Put us to the <laughs> test when you're connected. Wow. That I'm Jim, ready. give us a press one for and press two for. That was one of them. That was uh, oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Well, this press is actually a spot within your podcast, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, for good. Whoever that I didn't was. know if you were just showing off your his, skills or if that was an actual. No, I, actually I thought he was. Show, I was trying to be showcasing spot. his skills. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you wanted to hear? It was an actual no, spot. No, but you did both. It's like two birds, one stone. You, and you killed it, it. <laughs> and you got paid for it. This is great. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, John. Uh, Oh, Maserati. do, do it. Jim, it, Jim, you got it. It's the floor is yours. Todd Maserati, Alfa Romeo. Todd Bennett, you, uh, that's a point oh, yeah. for you, my friend. Yeah, for sure. To maintain the excellence of a luxury vehicle, you need more specialized care than regular vehicles. Let our experienced, certified, and trained technicians work for you. <laughs> <laughs> you put a little music bed under that, and I'm buying a Maserati. I'd be up, man. <laughs> So, John, your background in the dramatic arts, you like, did, like when you were in college, were you doing some Shakespeare and stuff and some oh, Mamet you know, or what? I wish I could say that. When I say I was a theater major, like I kind of backed into it because I didn't know what major to pick. Yeah. I did one play the whole time I was a theater major. One play. Yeah. And I, I played a London Bobby, and I think I had maybe two lines. You know, these theater kids, they already knew – each other so i was an outsider coming into their world and when you're doing that they make you do all the grunt work first so i was like you know i was the uh, the guy in charge of props i was the guy in charge of stage managing random things you know stuff that they didn't want to do that's the job i had to go through and by the time i got to a play i had already graduated you know it's like so i got to do one play but i picked theater not because I had a passion for theater, but I really thought it would be the easiest thing for me to do and, and, and get a degree because I had a natural sort of, you know, I liked people. I could do it. I'm, 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 I guess I'm good at lying. <laughs> 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 so I thought, well, let me do this. And yeah. I backed into it and I was taking a theater class. And um, I remember after the first scene I did with a partner, um, every kid in the class was like looking at me different. 
And after that, they were all coming up to me asking me like, can we do a scene together? Like, I'd love to do a scene with you. Let's do a scene. I was like, yeah, this is easy. What's wrong with you nerds? Because <laughs> the naturalism, I, I feel like, you know, all the things that I've seen you in the Eastbound and Down and the Herald and Kumar and Into the Storm. So you're, you're doing sitcoms, you're doing theatrical. And there is a, a little bit of a tie between all your characters. I mean, it's like you'll slick your hair back or you'll cut your, or you're clean shaven or your shirt's tucked in, but there's a little bit of that. You're playing a Southerner. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, that's my wheelhouse. Uh, I feel like that's the bread and butter. That's usually now if, if I get any kind of uh, part, that's, that's part of it, you know, but um, I'm happy to do it. I love doing it. Uh, being on Eastbound and down for, uh, on that series was like a dream come true because I was uh, that character uh, for Halloween, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was Danny McBride's character on Eastbound and Down for Halloween. I had the long black mullet wig. <sighs> I had fashioned my beard into like a, a goatee and I put black mascara in it. I had all black Johnny Cash looking stuff. And then fast forward three or four years later, here I am sitting next to him. And we're about to roll on the first take. And I was like, I had this moment of like, should I show him the picture of me dressed? Totally. As him? Please tell me you did. Well, I waited until the rap party. Ah, there you go. Uh, see, if I, if I thought, I, I actually thought about this. If I show him too soon, then I'm going to be a weird fanboy. You know, and as actors, you got you to gotta pretend, you got to at least trick yourself into thinking you're as good as the guy you're in the scene with. Because if you don't, then it, it won't be authentic. Sure. So I had to trick myself into thinking I'm as good as him. I belong here. Of course I do. Um, so if I show him a picture of me dressed as him, then it takes me down a notch. So I didn't want to do that until later. And I waited to the rap party and I finally came up to him and I told him the whole story. I was you for Halloween. I've been a fan of the show for a long time. <clears throat> In my brain, it was a big deal. And all he said was, that's dope, dog. <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess I you could know, have told you a long time ago. <laughs> don't take this the wrong way. Uh, but I could see you totally reprising the role of Cousin Eddie from uh, Vacation Movies. Shitter's full! Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Merry Christmas, shitter's full. <laughs> yeah. He's like, now, Clark, this is a real quality item. You mind if I fumigate this hair chair? <laughs> that is real nice, Clark. That is real, <laughs> real nice. nice. I mean, oh, no, don't mind him. He's just yakking on a bone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, daughters in clown college. Uh, sons in clown to, college. Daughters in rehab. You got uh, you got uh, Ed Helms, who did the uh, the reboot, who played the Clark character. They rebooted that, dude? Yeah. What? They re-released. You don't, you don't know that? No. They, they remade Christmas Vacation, Chevy Chase? Well, Vacation. They remade Vacation oh, with Ed, with Ed gotcha. Helms playing gotcha. like uh, Chevy Chase and um, uh, Beverly D'Angelo were now like the grandparents. Right. And the kids went cross country. It was a very funny movie. Yeah. Was Eddie, but Eddie was not in that movie. There was no Eddie character. Yeah, so yeah. You know, that they, actual real character, the guy. Uh, Randy Quaid. What's his name? Randy Quaid. Yeah. He's, mm -hmm. you should follow him on uh, Instagram. <laughs> oh yeah. He's uh dude. He's out there. He's uh the deep. It's entertaining. Is not deep enough. <laughs> he, he is running from something. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. I, but I, know, yeah, my brother just bought a camper. This is no joke. Jim's so got a camper. I do. His camper is like parked in, in our driveway right now. And so I told him for Christmas, we're doing the whole scene. We're going to shoot the shitters full. Oh, my God. Yeah. Do it. That's something to do, man. <laughs> oh, like my I God. You know what the craziest thing know. is? I don't, I don't know what this is, but for some reason, I, I can picture you so easily in a, in, in a kilt. Jim, do you oh. see it? Of course I don't I know. See it. He's I right just, here. What are you are you listening to me on the weekends? Rich? I I know, but there's something about that. I can see that little character with his little PP shooter with like in a kilt with some bagpipes. I was literally talking about this last weekend with my girlfriend. She is oddly attracted to dudes in kilts. Wait, just, <laughs> is it the no underwear thing or what? I, I, well, Easy we access. have to we have to get into her brain about that. But she 
something about it she she finds it attractive and manly like i think a long time ago a guy helped her with something in her house and he he came to build something or construct something and he had a kilt on and it caught her off guard she's like oh and so now it's triggered a thing and i told her i was like you know i could wear a kilt for you i could do that and so i have worn a kilt kilt or kilt kilt uh, i think it's either way kilt yeah i've worn a kilt one time and i did a sierra mist commercial it's the only commercial well one of the only other commercials I've done outside of Dodge, it was a Sierra, Sierra Mist commercial, and it was uh, I played one of other bagpipe players, and we're going through uh, New York in a parade, and it's uh, hot outside, and we're like, where's Wallace? And we're looking around for Wallace, and Wallace was standing over like some sort of grate with air coming up his kelp, you know, like a Marilyn Monroe type deal. Yeah. So that was the last time I wore one. But that commercial happened to be Patton Oswalt was in it. Yeah. Uh, Chip Channery, you had uh, 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 Chris Farley's brother was in it. Oh, yeah. I think we might be friends on Facebook. Yeah. Um, he looks just like his brother. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So he was in it. But that's the last time I wore one. But I would totally wear one. I think I would rock it because I look like, you know, I look like a Notre Dame mascot. Let's be honest. Yeah. I look like if I just did. You look yeah. like I should sound like this all the time. Oh, yeah. Top of the morning to you. Have and you, you been to Ireland course. and gone to the Guinness factory? No, I would love to, though. I've not been. I know you probably have, haven't you? It's, it's, the, it's the highest point in Dublin. And, like, Obama's been there. Tom Cruise has been there. You know, they would love to have you. And you just sit there, and the Guinness is way better than any Guinness you'll taste anywhere. Man, I would love to go. You know I feel I, I equate it to you remember when Dave Chappelle freaked out and he got mad at Comedy Central and he yeah. said, screw it. I'm just going to go to Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I, was that? That was probably 2007 ago. or eight. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. Right I feel like if height. I ever, if I ever have a moment like that, I say, frick it, I got to get out of this country. I'm going to go to Ireland. Yeah. That will be like my Africa. Cause I got the red beard. I got the red hair. I feel like there's probably a lot of my people over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would drink myself to death. I know it because those guys do not play. <laughs> they do they not don't play. mess around. Do they? I mean, there's pubs over there in London and Dublin that have been there for six hundred years. And some of the ceilings are so low because humans weren't, tall back then we didn't have <laughs> hormones in our meat and milk you know it's like they were just smaller people yeah no i uh i've been to london but i've not been uh, i didn't take the trip over to ireland but uh, i know what you're right with the with the pubs yeah uh that's crazy i mean and they're packed i went to, you're not gonna believe this i went to london to see phil collins oh yeah in hyde, gush, in, the, in hyde park wow yeah. If you so you're a Park? Phil Collins fan? I am. I like Phil Collins. Um, you guys probably know one of the best drummers, right? Most successful drummers at least, Phil Collins. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Philip you Collins? Guys like, do you guys like Phil Collins? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Of course. My God. They actually I recorded that, that drum sound. That go -gush, go -gush, go -gush, go -gush, go -gush. Everyone feels like they probably re they recorded that in like an air plane hanger but it was a very small tight recording studio with mics under the toms and they just turned up the reverb it was gated yeah. reverb yeah all of his drums are gated reverb yeah <sighs> it's iconic that that drum thing he did and because mm -hmm. now you know now when you hear it you think mike tyson oh, yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right punching out the guy on the hangover or whatever totally totally <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. that, remember that jim oh my I god do. yeah <laughs> we just watched that movie has there's such a great no 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 stop it's not it's yeah. so awkward about it it really it's, holds up the people who love like phil collins or i mean like really like them are they're all over the map it's not just one type of person right like you got like uh, uh soccer moms like tyson you got soccer yeah. moms and you got uh you know, the guy from, uh, what's the, uh, American Psycho? Remember that movie, American Psycho? Oh, oh. Christian Bale? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's pumping Susu Studio, and he's talking about how great Susu Studio is. That's so right. I'm he's getting ready to kill the guy. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. So, John Reap, American Dad, take yes. us back there. Did you get to work with Seth? Technically, yes. 
Well, you know, I, f- I recorded that in Charlotte, mm-hmm. North Carolina. Um, I never met Seth. Right. I just, it was crazy. I didn't even audition for this. I'm so, I'm, I'm still puzzled how this happened. I, I have agents and managers. They just sent me the submission. They go, would you like to be on an episode of American Dad? I'm like, well, of course. Of course. <laughs> and so I got the role and I was reading the script. My character is a guy named Clennard. And Clennard. Cl- yeah, Clennard. <laughs> C-L-E-O-N-A-R-D. Clennard. Clennard. <laughs> yeah, I love that they even come up with that name. I don't know one person named Clennard, but there should be millions of people named Clennard. Yeah. Um, but I remember, uh, so the script was, uh, the, uh, was it Stan, the lead character of American Dad or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's trying to avoid quality time with his wife. Um, and so he like wants to take her fly fishing or something and it's boring to her. Uh, the river's boring. So he dams it up and turns it into a lake. And then all of a sudden, all these rednecky lake people show up with their beers and their tubes and all this stuff. And I'm the king of the uh, redneck people. And so that was, it was easy. I just got the script. I went to Charlotte and read it a bunch of times and I could hear the director. I had earphones on. I could hear the directors in my ears. They were telling me what to say, what to change, how to do this or whatever, you know, give me direction. But I never actually talked to Seth. So I did not work with him. But if you watch the show, it's me talking to him. Although we never actually talked. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Oh yeah. my Seth God. McFarlane. Have you ever seen him on uh, Graham Norton? That clip of him? I know with, it, but I haven't seen it. It's him doing all the different voices. It's mm-hmm. one of the most highly viewed videos on YouTube. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. Uh, him and th- that and him singing uh, Cindy Lauper's um, Time After Time as Stewie. Which is hilarious. Well, you know what? But, to, just to get that show picked up, he had to do all the voices. He did yeah. all the voices. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's he, a guy uh, put the grind in. He basically, uh, he's on the show with Tom Cruise, um, the South African chick. I can't remember her name. She was in a bunch, oh, yeah. bunch of movies. She's very famous. Oh, yeah. Yep. 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 Now, you ki- now it's killing Speaking me. Speaking of forgetting think. names, Emily Blunt and Charlize Theron. She, Charlize he's on, Theron. You know, yeah, three major heavy hitter actors, right? And he's got them in the palm of his hand the whole yeah, time. That's a laughing. captivating video. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Hilarious. Super talented guy. Well, you're doing something right. They're like, hey, we want this John guy. What, what's the nearest studio that we that we like? That we let uh, Get him over to Charlotte. You know, it's like, I mean, it's like they, they wanted you, man. Yeah, I was very flattered. Um, so, so if I'm always playing the southern rednecky guy, and and that leads to being on American Dad, I'll take it. You know, it's why like, not? I want to. I would love to 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 corner that market. You know, be the go to redneck guy for everything. Yeah, that's why I, I had a, I had a conversation with Jay Moore about that, and he came in. I used to do radio in Vegas for four years, so we had a lot of people that came inside the radio station constantly. And he was he was a regular because he would always do um, you know he always, can do oh my gosh his voice he does great voices but he um he at the time was dominating these movie roles where he played like an asshole he always played a jerk you know yeah. from Jerry Maguire to all these different roles and he came into the studio to do some voicers for us and uh, we got to talking and I said you know I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you should really double down on this on, on a particular kind of character that you seem to be really good at which is fun funny because you're completely in real life the antithesis of this character he goes what is that i said you play a really good jerk (laughs) (laughs) and he took it as a compliment yeah he's like he's like wow i said there's money to be made there i'm saying right and it's might as well was did you think he was secretly offended or do you think he took it a hundred percent as a compliment I think he probably, you know, I I mean, I don't know what they're being fed, you know, from their people that, well, you got to diversify. I mean, if you could, if you could do, if you could Danny Trejo your life in in Hollywood, (laughs) you are going, you're going to do well. You know, I I had almost, it's funny you say that because I had almost the exact conversation with uh, Matt Walsh. mm -hmm. Uh, So I did a movie called Into the Storm, big tornado movie. Yeah. And, um, It wasn't a comedy, but my part was like the comic relief or whatever. Matt Walsh, great, successful actor, been in tons of stuff, right? He's the guy that started the Upright Citizens Brigade. Wow. Um, UCB Theater, that's that's his baby. He started all that stuff. But everything he's done, he's kind of been an a-hole or a jerk. 
And I had him on back. I forgot what my podcast was called back then. I think it was just called the John Reap show, but I had, I had my little phone and I just recorded me and him talking in my trailer. And I said almost the exact same thing that you said. I said, dude, I got to hand it to you. You are so good at playing like an asshole, man. You like, you got it down. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying yeah. like, it's believable. And I know you're not that because I hang out with you. We've, we on set, we've, we've, we've buddied yeah. around, you know, he grilled out for us one night. He took us all out for pizza one night. He's a nice guy, but yep. he's good at that. You know, know what I mean? Yeah. I told, so how I do you tell him. someone they're good at being, being an a-hole without like, I being padded it. it. I said, you said in real life, dude, you seem like just a sweetheart of a guy. You come in here, you're rambunctious, you're friendly with everyone. You're very approachable, but I got to tell you something, you dominated this and you should really go that, you know, and he didn't. And now we're, he's kind of doing like, he made a compliment sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, but, you know, and the funny thing is, is that we were doing, we did dueling walk-in impressions on KLUC and he uh, afterwards comes in, he starts coaching me on my walk-in impression. I said, I said, Jay, let me just stop you right there. It's me doing you doing walk-in. That's how I learned how to do this. Okay. And he goes, and, and, and he's like, well, you do a really good job. I said, yeah, because you do. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, I didn't come up with this on my own. <laughs> well, so I'm that's that talented. Compliment. Yeah, I bet yeah. he liked that. Yeah. He's, well, he's I, did, a, he I, had Jeff, I had Jeff Foxworthy on an episode of Country-ish podcast, and – it took me about 30, 40 minutes to get to the part where I told him back in the day, I used to do an impression of you, Jeff Foxworthy. And I said, it's, it's not, it's an abstract weird impression. It's an impression. I said, it's you, if you were belligerently drunk and you couldn't understand a word Jeff Foxworthy said, but you still got the joke. And I said, would you like to hear it? <laughs> and he goes, I have a little TT in my pants right now in anticipation of this. <laughs> and oh, so I did my joke for him. But it was, it was scary because I didn't want to offend him, you know, because hey. I think he's great. But he did have a cadence. I could do it for you now if you'd like to hear it. Of Go course. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, again, I'll set it up. This is Jeff Foxworthy after an all-night of drinking uh, Boone's Farm. He's hammered. You can't understand a word he says, yet he's still funny. All right, mm-hmm. ready? Here we go. <clears throat> he never gives you a job on the end of all you say. He never give a game. No way. He gets no. that drunk? No, no, he doesn't. If he does. Oh, gotcha. I'm Thank. saying if. This is an abstract... If he were to be, I don't think he drinks at all. I'm but what about saying, Ron White? Does Ron oh, White drink no, that Ron much? Ron White is the real deal. I have met and worked with Ron White. and uh, Is the whiskey he, in the glass real up there? I'll tell you, the first time I met him, I had to go pick him up at the hotel room. And I didn't know him. He didn't know me. It was before his success. I was the opener. He was the headliner. That was part of the gig is go pick up the headliner. <laughs> Mark Marin talks about that. Hey, we always had to pick up the headliner. Yeah, that's a hundred percent truth. That's yeah. like part of the deal, you know. It's like oh. you go get the headliner. So I'm knocking on this dude's door, who I didn't know. Ron White answers the door. All he is wearing is boxer shorts and a black sock. And his hair's pushed over to one side. He's got one eye open and one eye shut. And he looks me up and down. He goes, We're gonna be a little bit late. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think so. Goes, get, in, get, in, get in there. And I go in his room and it looked like a tornado hit it. There was trash everywhere. Pizza boxes. Cans, and whiskey pizza bottles. boxes. There was a paper plate with ketchup on the side, maybe a couple of French fries left, and cigarettes put out in the ketchup. He's the, re- <laughs> he's the real deal. Did you see him? He did a great job on HBO's Roadies. He played this road manager. It was for two seasons. And like he had to like, uh, there was a lot of emoting and crying. And he, it was, he did did not. No, I have not seen that. I would like to though. He did great. Yeah. Well, he's hilarious. Um, He's a character. He's a real deal. That guy works hard and plays hard. Yeah. 100%. I'm white. 
Ron White. So this is something I, since I, you know, do a little motivational speaking, I like to try to bring the motivation in from our guests and you're a highly successful individual. If, if there's someone that wants to come up in the comedy game, the acting game, they want to be a commercial actor. What's the, what advice would you give them, John? Uh, take two weeks off and quit. We got <laughs> enough of you. We got enough of you. <laughs> Come on. We don't need, I don't need more competition. That's true. Right? No, I'm kidding. I would say uh, totally uh, learn as much as you can where you're at, you know? Um, so I got lucky. I started in, in North Carolina because there was a club there. It was next to me. And I learned as much as I could there. And I got as big and as smart as I think I could there. And then I started going out, meeting other people, taking their advice, you know, um, if you're doing comedy, I'd say just it's all repetition. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. You need to get – it's a muscle. you got to keep practicing it. So you got to keep doing it. Um, acting, I don't mind telling you, take some classes. Learn from, learn from people. You know, when I moved to L.A., I took a class. Who were uh, some of your teachers? I, cause, Ivana Chubbuck. Oh, Ivana nice. Ivana Chubbuck Scene Study. I took her class. Beautiful. And also took a commercial intensive when I first got out there. It was like an all-day, like a whole weekend sort of a training thing about just auditioning. In yeah. itself. And so I learned a lot, you know, you can, you can sort of, uh, uh, cut down the learn, you know, the uh, learning curve. If you take a couple of classes, yeah. now, if you're the kind of guys like, I don't need no class. Well, good. You'll spend two years figuring it out. Yeah. Uh, or you could just shave off two years and let some people tell you, okay, well that's not necessary. This is necessary. Okay. That's bull. Do this. Don't do that. Knowledge um, is power. Yeah. So, so yeah, learn, learn. Don't be afraid to, to, to learn. How long do you think it took for you to, to get your comedy wings where you're like doing, you're doing tons of stand up, but then you felt like, you know, you, you, you had, you had a groove and, and it was starting to flow. How long does that take? Well, there's different levels of it. To be honest with you. There's the first level of getting your first laugh and you're like, Oh wow, that was great. That's even addictive. Though, I'm sure. Even though you're up there seven minutes and you get one laugh. You're <laughs> like, That's all I needed to hear. But then it's like, so you, you, there's different levels. I think sure. one, of the, one of the best moments is an out-of-body out of experience where you're actually on stage, you're telling jokes, everyone is into it. The whole crowd is laughing hysterically so hard that you have, you have to stop talking, otherwise they won't hear the next word out of your mouth. You have to finish, you have to let them finish laughing. That's awesome. So as that's happening, you're kind of standing there and you have another, another thought in your brain. So I could be telling jokes and, and it going great, but simultaneously be thinking, what's my next thing going to be? Oh, I got the light. I should wrap this up. Okay, well, I'll end with this bit. As I'm talking, doing a whole nother thing. So it's crazy how your brain is, is capable of doing stuff like that. Um, that. That's just one of my favorite levels. Getting to the level where you can be in the moment, yet also be thinking about something entirely different. <laughs> well, I love that. Man, crazy. Jim, your favorite part of the show. That's right. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. It is the random question of the day, John. I can't wait. I've this pulled my this question the show. randomly. <laughs> How likely do you think it will be that humans will last another 1,000 years without killing ourselves off? How likely do I think it will be? I think it is not very likely. Uh, when you are given what has happened in the course of this year, um, you know, I'm, I'll predict I'm going to go 20, 2047. We're done. Wow. The that's Mayans true. were off by, you know, they, well, they predict 2002. I've seen the memes where they go, they got, they got the uh, 2012. Okay. They got it wrong. It was there off by, if you flip the two and the one, they were kind of, you know, 2021's coming up. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe they just mm. got the, the, the digits wrong. Oh, but, something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. What a crazy year. <laughs> what a crazy year. But I'm looking forward to, you know, the fall is wonderful, especially in Nashville when the leaves are changing colors and we got the, you know, pumpkin pie and tons of Cool Whip. I mean, this is what, like, I love this time of year. I really do. This, I always cool Whip or Cool Whip? Cool Whip. Cool Whip. Stan would say. Cool how whip. would you say, wait a minute, how, how, how say, say Whip. Whip, Whip. You say Cool Whip. Cool Whip. 
<laughs> Family Guy. That's classic. Ex- episode. John, this has Family been crazy, man. This has just been really, really enjoyable. You're just a really approachable hey. guy, man. Funny yes. as hell. JohnReap.com. Everyone check out his live records on all the uh, file sharing, not file sharing, but streaming services. It's you everywhere. Got, you got Ginger Payne, 2019. Ginger Beard Man, 2019. Metro Jethro going back to 2009. You got a special on Amazon Prime. What's that called? That's the Ginger Beard Man. That's, oh, that's one Ginger Beard Man. Just read it. Yeah, that one. You got to pick up those masks. Pick up those masks so you can scare your neighbors and scare people when you're grocery shopping. And of course, check out the country ish podcast john thanks so much man hey my pleasure anytime guys i really appreciate it man have a great weekend when that show gets picked up i'll put the band together for for the house band for that show it'd be incredible we got my my producer's recording this we got you on tape saying that i'm gonna hold you to it i love that you're one of your guys on your team is alan jackson i'm like what hey uh, when you guys need an announcer voice when you need an announcer voice, I'm more than happy to provide that too. Ready Bam. To, All right. I got ready to rumble. To See, we're cross pollinating left and right. John, thank you guys so much. JohnReap.com. When things open up, check him out on the road. He's doing hopefully New Year's Eve three nights at Zany's, one of the greatest comedy clubs in the history of the world. Everybody has been there. And guys, we appreciate you. Hey, you got some praise for us? We'll read a letter on the air at the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. As always, subscribe, share, rate, and review. Jim, you got something to say? No, all good. You got something something to say? We had a blast here, guys. Keep coming back for the good stuff, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, John. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.